on in. You coming in then? Good morning, and what a show we've got lined up for you today. I'll be talking to a true legend of daytime TV. When Holmes Under the Hammer start, Martin Roberts will be dropping by the house. Yay! And with the Six Nations rugby in full swing here on ITV, I'll be scrubbing down with former top Welsh rugby star Scott Quinnell will be here as well. Yay! Exactly. Uh, and we're heading down to the road uh, to see a classic pub dish cooked by chef Lenny Carl Roberts uh, and see what he's got on the menu for us today. And chef, food writer and two-time finalist of the Rue Scholarship, Sabrina Guido will be dropping by again. Uh, she's got an amazing recipe for us. That's coming up shortly. And I'll be showing you three different ways to make use of the classic condiment mayonnaise in this week's Little Masters. I'll be showing you how to make it properly as well. And that's not all, because I'm joined today by a good mate of mine and a friend of the show who's a true master of French cooking. It's the fabulous Daniel Gabish. Welcome to the show, Sheffy. Um, it's a bit chilly out here. A little bit chilly. Just, uh, even though I've got the barbecue on and the heater on, yes. I'm actually going to... I'm going to ching-ching and I'm going to drink this wine before it freezes, to be honest with you. Yeah, ching-ching. So, so, welcome. Now, you've been travelling around all over the place. You've been, just come back from Dubai, haven't you? Uh, just literally last yesterday, yeah. Back from Dubai. Correct, yeah. How was that? Brilliant. Yeah, nice place, isn't but it? Busy. Got rich, different restaurants opening up all the time. Uh, 800 well. last year. Wow, New 800 restaurant. different yeah, restaurants. Unbelievable. So what is interesting with Dubai now uh, also, that it used to be a stopover. Destin now it's becoming a destination. Yeah. So it's a big difference. And a lot of uh, uh, gents who've been on your show, yeah. uh, you know, are opening restaurants over there. Is that I mean, something that you've got in, in the Italy. pipeline, you got planned? Is it... Uh, not, no. <laughs> not yet, anyway. I love the way you yet, asked your anyway. question. No, no, uh, no, I know no. you didn't bring some of the food with you in the in the bag in the in your suitcase over. You you do monkfish for us today with mussels, is that? Yes, we do. What are you going to be doing with it? Uh, beauty. Also, I love monkfish when it's on the bone yeah. because it keeps the flavour. And I'm going to roast it in a casserole. After that, I will put it on the side, and in the same casserole, I'm going to do a kind of ragu of mussel with saffron, lemongrass, and chili and ginger which is all giving you some really vibrant, interesting flavour, and the saffron is going to add a small accent to it. See, which what I, really I love about love. the French is, well, you don't waste anything, because when you're in France and you're going around the markets, you see monkfish oh, we've, quite we've, a lot. We've seen that together in but Britain, you remember? The, the chick. Oh, that's a... We never seem to get it in the UK. I know, people, and I don't know why. I mean, the cheek of fish is amazing. When I used to go in the Seychelles, I used to have a fish head curry. Yeah. It was just amazing. And but it's the, a head, you know. The, but the, the monkfish are, cheeks and the monkfish are amazing. Beautiful. Oh, 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 anyway. So, anyway, there we're you go. kicking things off today, uh, not, with a, not with a French dish, not with uh, monkfish cheeks, but uh, <laughs> a sort of a variant of a chicken tagine. I'm going to do it like a whole uh, salad using this sort of uh, matoul that we've got over here. I'm going to show you in a little bit of that and introduce this to some amazing ingredients a little bit later. First thing first, with this chicken, we're going to uh, make our sort of marinade for our chicken first of all, I suppose. Uh, in here we've got some spices, I've got some rasanu, I've got some cumin, I've got some saffron, I've got some turmeric in there, and I'm going to use some really good Palestinian olive oil. Yeah. Well, do you know... Which we're going to talk really, about. Yes, <laughs> it's, it's, I was going to say. So I'm, I'm just, it is yeah. amazing, this, isn't it? You've yeah. just been having a taste of some of these ingredients as well. So I've just got the chicken. I'm going to pop that in here. We're just going to marinate that. It can be in there for about 20 minutes. Uh, I've got one in there that's been marinated overnight, but we're just going to chop this all up. Um, I put it in the fridge because it's warmer than it is out here. Um, but you just want to <laughs> mix all here. that lot up and we're just going to leave that to one side. I'm going to fry that off in a pan as well. So we'll just move that, I'll just quickly wash my hands. And then in the pan we can start with our onions and everything else and just make this nice little sort of very, very quick sort of stew really. Mm. I'm going to fry off my uh, chicken. So nice hot pan. In we go with the chicken. And this is all going to start to fry off in here to get all those spices going. Now, like That's I was saying... Straight away is going to smell amazing. It's going to smell oh, yeah. unbelievable. And like I was saying, these amazing ingredients, you know, and, and it's, not, well, it's the first time ever, I think, in 16 years, I, I blame myself for that, really, is talking about food from this part of the world. Palestine. Yeah, and I'm really glad you're doing that because it seems for me, and it's always a forgotten part of the world, and yet... They grow magnificent produce. Oh, I mean, olive, we're talking olive oil. Here. I've, here. I've tried it only once, and I thought it was amazing, and I couldn't find it back 
I mean... Until now. Until now. Until now. Now yes. you're here, you're, you're able yeah. to, in the next five minutes, you'll now know where to get them from, because yes. uh, we're hopefully going to find out where these amazing ingredients come from. We're going to speak to Heather and uh, Manal from Zaytoum. Uh, welcome to the show, guys. I can see you on the line there. Slightly warmer in an <laughs> office. <Yeah. laughs> <laughs> Hello. So Hi, now tell us about day. tell good us about this amazing business that you have, really, and what, how special it is. How did it all start? Were, were both of you into food? How how did it come about? We are definitely both into food. So we started nearly twenty years ago now. So back in two thousand and three, I saw a message going round inviting people to come and join the olive harvest in Palestine, and it was simply a life-changing trip for me. So the landscape there is just characterized by the olive tree. And during the olive harvest, really, it's a joyous time. Extended families come back together. So in these groves, you know, ancient trees from hundreds of years old, you've got everyone in the family together hand-picking the olives. Fabulous. So during that trip, we learned how hard it is to produce olive oil at this sort of family farm scale, and also receive the warmest, most generous hospitality and saw and heard from people that were just having a really hard time simply harvesting their fruit and producing this delicious olive oil. Was that was the difficulty of the, of this amazing produce, but was it difficult getting access to where they were to get access to the global market? Was that, that kind of the difficulty with it? Because obviously they knew how good it was because they were producing it and eating themselves, but to, to, to sustain it and keep it going, they needed access to other markets. That's right. So these are farmers who family has been attached to the land, you know, over the generations. But back then, they were selling their product at below the cost of production um, because of the difficulties of the political situation oh, there. Yeah, exactly. So for us, like, tasting this phenomenal product, like you, when we got home, we couldn't find Palestinian olive oil anywhere. So we thought, surely, some small thing we could do is to bring over some olive oil for friends and family. So we brought a couple hundred bottles. It went like that. And so we this was kind of like the there. earliest days of sort of crowdfunding, but not crowdfunding, was <laughs> it? Of course, yeah. That's it, analogue crowdfunding. Yeah, and we were, you know, we were overwhelmed that we were just getting calls from strangers saying, oh, we heard you've got some Palestinian olive oil. So we thought, there, you know, there's an opportunity here. So we formed a company called Zaytun, which is the Arabic word for olives. Oh, yeah, yeah. Brought over the first container of olive oil. You know, once people have tasted Palestinian olive oil, they want more. And I love this. We you end up buying with... olive oil by the container very, very quickly. We did. <laughs> but it's not just it's not just the oil you've got as well. Tell us about this spice. What what do you do with this? What is this? So za'atar is um, is a traditional herb mix that's made from an indigenous variety of thyme that's mixed with sumac, sea salt and a little bit of olive oil, so really pure, but it goes on absolutely everything. It lifts every dish, a tomato salad, mm. roasts, oh, yeah, tomato just salad, a gorgeous piece of warm bread dipped in olive oil and za'atar is, is a joy to eat. Mm. So would you, so, so people watching this who've never used it before, would you cook with it or would you just use it as a finishing little spice? What, what, what do you, where, where so does it lie? So traditionally eaten, Traditionally, it's really uh, a duo with the olive oil. They're like the bride and the groom. You eat them together, I love that. Um, <laughs> you know, with a piece of, of lovely fresh bread. But also, we think it's amazing on salads, like I said, on roasts, um, on, on, on a nice cheese, toasted cheese sandwich. It the just Frenchman likes it on dishes. tomato, you're saying, as well. But, oh, yes. you know, not just that. Yeah. The, the, uh, we've got on here, we've got so, I mean, so many things we could talk about as well. Oh. These almonds. The, these, the, I mean, these are amazing, these almonds. But particularly, really tell, me, tell me about the dates, because the, these are incredible. I'm going to use it in, into this sort of salad that I've got in here. But tell us about these amazing medjool dates. So the medjool dates are grown uh, by Fayez al -Anuz. His palm grove is just outside the ancient city of Jericho. And it's the climate in Jericho that makes these dates so incredibly fudgy. Um, it's, yeah, really it that. takes uh, years of tending and pruning and um, really good harvest practices to produce such high quality dates, which is why they've won a great taste award, which we're very proud of. But one other thing that I want to touch on as well, which, which I'd not seen for a long, long time, to be honest with you, and I'd not really cooked it for about 10 years, was, was this. This is this giant couscous. Now, Tell us about this thing, because couscous as we know it is like a manufactured grain, it's like pelletized, and then if you're going to make something something like tabouleh, you would use sort of the bulgur wheat sort of yeah. stuff with a cracked grain. 
What is this and, and where does it come from? So this is a very Palestinian product and it is a giant couscous, but as you say, not a couscous. So whenever we've been given maftool in Palestine, we feel like honoured guests because there is a lot of work that goes into making maftool and a lot of skill. Like we've been with chefs um, who've come out with us who, who find it difficult to roll this grain. It's a real artisanal skill. So when it's served in Palestine, it's huge, you know, feasting platters and people gather and it's really, it's a feasting food. Well, I've got, I've got some over here and I just wanted, I want to open this up actually, but just to show people what this is like at home, really, when you, when you open this up. Because th you say this is, you know, when you look at bulgur wheat, that's machine made, you look at couscous... Yeah, I know, oh, that's, that's, I mean, it's, it's hand, cracked, it, but... Can you believe but it's hand, handmade? Can you believe this is handmade? Yeah. I mean, that is the thing, yeah? So, the, oh, every one of these is handmade. The work goes Julius in that. rolled by hand, very skillfully rolled by hand. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. I mean, that, that is just every single one I mean, of them it's made just by just crazy, yeah? It's brilliant. So what next for you, then? What, what's, what's, the, what's the goal for, for you as a, as a company, as a group? Or what, what's next for you? To keep going, to keep spreading the word more? What, what's next for you? Yeah, we really hope that more and more people will, will taste Palestinian products. Um, we hope, as well as enjoying products that might be new or unique, there will be an interest in the provenance, in the farmers behind these products. Yeah. Um, we would be delighted if yourselves and people would come and join us on the olive harvest in Palestine. We really just think it's... OK, we come in. Yes, we're, we're, we're sorting it. We're, 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 we're coming. We're, we're off. <laughs> That's it. We've only got to invite me and him once, but, oh, uh, you know, tell you. I have to say, and, and it's so, what's so interesting about this, and this is why I want to say thank you for doing this, because as chefs, we think we, think we know a lot about food. You know, yeah. uh, we don't. Yeah. We only know a little bit. A, huh? a little bit of a little bit of a percent. Oh, nothing oh, really. Yeah. No matter how many years you've been doing it, you know nothing about food. It's so it's a body. learning curve for everybody. So I think, you know, you guys introducing us to food like this, we want to thank you really, and also you can then thank the farmers as, yeah. as well back in Palestine because the, the the stuff that I've tasted. You know, we get a lot of things in the office, and um, it's unbelievable. The stuff I've tasted, the the dates are just. It's changed my view on that, that uh, what a date should be, really. It really has. And, and that's, you know, I've been cooking a long, long time, and I think you have as well. But, but it's... you know what, what I noticed with those dates, uh, James, and they are much firmer than all the other dates you find, which are super soft. And I like the fact they are firmer. They seem to enclose the flavour much more. Do yeah. you know what I mean? So possibly due to the climate uh, over there, maybe they let them dry differently. I don't know, but yeah. they are excellent. Well, we'll we'll be on the next plane out of there. That's I'm it. Absolutely, We're coming. Uh, absolutely sure. But but best of luck with everything. Thank you for being a part of this. I'm just going to finish this off Thank now. Thank you so much. Yeah. Well, stay on the Thank line because you. you can see whether I've done justice to it or not. But we're going to grab a little bit of salt over the top. I'm going to put a decent amount of salt in the stew as well. That's going to go in there. And then you can see. I mean, it's testament to the ingredients. You get this amazing colour. Just look at the colour of this. Ah, uh, but that's fantastic, huh? Look at that. But I guess over there, that's the kind of food they do. It's a sharing thing, isn't it? Yeah. And they make the bread fresh and... Oh. I guess it's a bit warmer over there than it is here. Well, that's, <laughs> that's, that's the second reason why we should go for the harvest. Exactly. Yes. But, yeah. <laughs> and then, then we've got our lovely stew. And then what I will do with the stew is I'll just finish this off. Uh, I've got some bit of parsley, bit of coriander, bit of mint. And Which is perfect, then. Huh? Yeah. I just think finish this off with a little... Bit of herb in here, and then I'm just going to top it with some of this amazing spice. But in there, I've got the olive oil, I've got some lemons. You can put things like that. You can put the salted lemons as well, but I've just got some fresh lemons in, in there as well. So Lemon juice, yeah. But we're just going to take our pot of loveliness and just serve that on there. When you see, very, very quickly, we made this nice stew. Tin tomatoes. But mind you, with the produce like that, then, I mean, you don't need to do much, do you? I, mean, I think so. I think it just speaks for itself, doesn't it, really? Yeah, but definitely. The, the flavours, the definitely. colours. Yeah. You know? And I it's put vibrant. Some, it's I happy put, food, isn't it? And it's actually, by putting those dates in there, it's actually thickened it up like, lovely as well. It's just had a nice little bit of touch of thickening. Happy warm food. Well. Fabulous. But there we have it. 
Oh. All I've done is remember to take the stones out of the little dates. Yeah, is that our lunch, is it? That is good. That's our breakfast, actually, mate. Uh, breakfast, yeah, it's sorry, breakfast, of course, to be honest. <laughs> it's breakfast. <laughs> and then that's it. And then I'm just going to finish this off with some of this spice. So hopefully that's done it justice, ladies. And like I said, we'll, we'll be checking the flight Thank details so this afternoon. Yes, All right. absolutely. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank, Thank you so much. Wow. Daniel, this wow. is your starter. <laughs> I'm so <laughs> lucky. No, mate. And also, look at the colours. Ah, the colours are amazing, isn't wow. it? Wow. I want you to try this as well. I, the thing that amazed me... And this by is hand. Was, that's what I was reading about last no, night. No, 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 mate. I mean, it's crazy it's stuff. made by hand. Mmm. Mm. The, ingre the ingredient. It's nutty. Right. Mmm. Love it. I love it, yeah. And fresh lemon and the olive oil. It's great. It's perfect, yeah. Happy. Right, mm -hmm. Daniel, we'll be making a delicious dish of monkfish uh, a little bit later, and I'll be catching it with Holmes under the hammer star Martin Roberts very shortly. But don't go anywhere, because after the break, we're off to the pub where Lenny Carl Roberts is demonstrating another classic recipe. I'll see you in a bit. You're enjoying that, are you? Ooh! <laughs> so much flavour. Good, huh? Welcome back. Now, there's a mass class in mayonnaise coming your way a little bit later, and I'll be cooking for Martin Roberts from Holmes Under the Hammer. That's up next. But before that, I thought I'd take a look at some of the amazing dishes you've been cooking at home. And first up, we've got a photograph from Vicky Birthright, who made a quiche out of camembert, leeks and mushrooms. Look at that. Uh, next, we've got an amazing-looking Charlotte Royale that's been made by Linda Goldsworthy. They're not easy to get right, that, but you've mastered that one. Excellent work there as well. And finally, top marks this week goes to Gavin Welsh, who's gone all chefy with his chilli crab, sweet corn velouté, which is technically a soup, uh, with crab mousse. How good does that look? OK, Sabrina Guida will be taking over the kitchen very shortly, and it's time now for a recipe, and this time a pub classic. And this week, we're heading to my local pub, which is over in that direction, to meet up with Lenny Carl Roberts, and he's showing us how to make restaurant-quality mushrooms on toast. Well, I'm really excited to cook this amazing mushrooms on toast dish for you today and show you a few tips on the way. It's a classic pub dish. I'll talk you through the ingredients. First of all, the mushrooms. These are forest mushrooms, um, superb, Girol. I've got some seps here, and I've also got some king oyster. A uh, little bit of thyme. And then we've got some shallot. I've got some garlic. I've got some mustard, some double cream, fresh truffle from Milcher and some blue cheese, sourdough and butter. And this dish couldn't be easier. It's a great dish which you can do at home. This dish is all about the quality of the ingredients. The better the quality ingredient, the better the dish. So the best mushrooms you can get, the best sourdough, the best truffle, and it's great. So first of all, let's go with the sourdough. All I'm going to do here is add a little bit of olive oil. Rub it into the sourdough. Is a garlic cut in half, and we're literally just rubbing that across the sourdough. It's not like garlic bread. It's like it just flavours it with a little hint of garlic. There's already garlic in the dish itself. Now, once that's done, under the grill or in the oven. So, toast on. Let's get on with the mushrooms. So, we're going to start with a warm pan on medium heat and we're just going to add a little bit of olive oil to the pan. And we want to get that quite warm. And I don't want it to get too hot, because I don't want to burn the shallot. Now, we're going to straight in with the shallot. And this moment here of sauteing these shallots is quite important, because this is where you get the sweetness actually in to the, to the dish itself. So a bit more heat there. Nice sizzle. And this shallot gives a huge depth of flavour and earthiness to the dish, which is fantastic. They're coming across lovely. The aroma from these shallots is just great. The whole dish is very aromatic, especially with the fresh truffle as well. So now we've got the shallots nicely sweated off. We're going to add our garlic. And just turn that heat down a little bit, because I don't want to burn the garlic. 
you know, that's why you always add onion first and then the garlic later, because the garlic has a tendency to, to burn, and bitter garlic is a, is a bad flavor to have in any dishes. So now our garlic, our shallot, it's nicely softened. And now we're going to add our butter. That butter is going to form a, an emulsion, which we're going to fry our mushrooms in. So now with the thyme. So I'm just going to add a little bit of thyme. It's chopped thyme, been picked. And then in with these lovely mushrooms. I've got girol here. I've got uh, eringue. And I've also got seps, all locally foraged. And that smell coming off these mushrooms is fantastic. Now we can turn the heat back up a little bit. And we'll start the first bit of seasoning. So, nice bit of salt. Lots and lots of black pepper. So, mushrooms are coming along really lovely now. And I'm taking my time with the mushrooms. Like I say, it's a, it's a low energy dish for us. It's all in one pan, a bit of a grill work, and that's it. And as I'm sauteing these mushrooms, I'm driving off moisture. And as I drive off the moisture, I'm adding flavor of the mushroom. And they're coming on just lovely. And now we can start adding the brandy to this dish. That just deglazes the pan, adds a richness to the dish as well, and takes all that lovely caramelized mushroom off the bottom. And then in this pan here, I've got some dried mushrooms which I've rehydrated with uh, some boiling water. All I'm going to do is drain those, save some of the liquid, and add the chopped mushrooms to it as well. This gives a great unami flavor to the dish. So I'm just going to chop these nice and fine and add that to the same dish. There we go. Beautiful. Those mushrooms have got color. They are coming on beautifully. And now, to finish the dish, we're almost at the end now. I'm going to add some mustard, Dijon mustard. I'm going to add the cream. Now, this dish. I can't explain to you how good it's smelling. It's amazing. So that's just going to reduce a little bit, let the sauce thicken. I'm just going to have a little taste, make sure I've got the seasoning just well. A little bit more salt. It's so important to taste throughout the dish because seasoning, you know, I was once told by a very, very famous chef, the difference between a, a fantastic dish and an amazing dish can sometimes be a pinch of salt. So taste all the time. Delicious. So now we're ready to plate. I'll get my toast. Let's get going. That's perfect. You say the whole process takes no time whatsoever. You can see that the mushrooms have absorbed the cream, the brandy, the flavor is amazing. And it's rich and unctuous. You know, pubs up and down the country, this is what this is what they serve. This great hearty food with local ingredients. Cooked with love. Beautiful. And then to finish this dish, all we're going to do is get this amazing truffle. Winter truffle. This truffle just needs to be shaved, and then we'll add it on top of our mushroom dish. And just to finish this, some local blue cheese. And this gives an a added creamy and sort of slightly acidic flavor note to it. And that, for me, is the epitome of what great British pub food needs to be about. Fantastic. So this is my amazing mushrooms on toast dish, which I think you'll absolutely love. It's a classic for pubs, and it's not expensive. It's a great dish, and you should see this in all pub menus in the UK.
How good were they? Taste delicious as well. Sabrina Guida will be putting her own spin on Alu Gobi very shortly. And Chef Daniel Garmiche will be taking over my kitchen. That's later on this morning. But we'll see you after the break when I'll be treating Holmes Under the Hammer star Martin Roberts to not one recipe, but two. First off is having hoisin duck. I'll see you after the break. Welcome back. Now, coming up, uh, we'll have another delicious recipe from chef Sabrina Gida. But first, I'm here with an icon of daytime TV who's been presenting the nation's favourite property shows for nearly 20 years from Homes Under the Hammer. It's the one and only Martin Roberts. Yes! <laughs> Sing, we've got you. Yes. We eventually got you. We meet, we meet at all these what? sort of things. I know. And he goes, you're never invited. I said, we do, but you're always busy. <laughs> you're always the busiest man on television by the sounds of it as well. I made it here and I'm so delighted. Because we share so many passions in our lives, uh, from collecting cars and motorhomes yeah. and to, I mean, I mean we, uh, all manner of different I sorts was just, of... I was just in your little green room there, your boys' room, and right. it's just full of the most wonderful eclectic collection of toys and, and, and fruit machines and all, all sorts of things. Well, it brings exactly back memories of a childhood. When I was, I'm going to yeah. cook, cook this duck with hoisin for you as well, because it's one of your favourite sort of things. I'm going to cook this duck and I'm just going to pan fry it first of all. Awesome. I'm getting to do this sauce. But uh, it is in a collection of uh, sort of everything from your childhood as well, uh, so, my childhood as well. But, I mean, you, that, that's the reason why you collect it, isn't Yeah, it, it is. And, I, and I, don't, I don't keep a diary, really, of my life. But what I do is I've collected things along the way. That, that just take me back to places. Yeah. And, and, you know, oh, yeah, I remember that. I remember where I got that. Or I remember what I was doing at that time of my life. And there's also things probably you got in there that maybe when you were growing up you couldn't afford, like, yeah. you know, like dinky toys. Yeah. And I've got, like, a dinky toy of a, uh, of a combine harvest. And I remember going to this toy shop when I was a kid. Yeah. And it was, like, £2.50. It was just way outside my pocket money rate. Yeah. And when I, years later, I got, I got one and just thought, I've got to have that. And now they're 150, but, 150. Now, we've got to talk about the bit, you know, after your childhood, you wanted, wanted to do the service career. It was never television, it was never radio. It was electrical engineering, wasn't it? So, yeah, I mean, you know, I, when you think about it, I've got young kids now and you look at their, their decision-making process, it's all a little bit random. Yeah. But I keep on telling them, it doesn't matter where you start, it's where you end up. And the did did was... you get to a stage where it was engineering was a career, or did you just straight the ship from there to something completely different? So when I was at university, the actual course was one thing, but I got involved in the media society and I, I presented on the on the, the I was went for, went to Bradford University and, and they had a, a university radio stage. And it's actually where I learnt my oh, I'd say learnt a lot of my skills. Because I, I, from university, I went on to work for local radio, so I worked in BBC Local Radio. Right. And what, as a, as, a, as a journalist or as a presenter on radio? Or? Well, kind of, I mean, I, much to the annoyance of my next-door neighbour, who's the only person in my entire life who gave me a hard time about it, I left university and went, I'm not going to do that, because halfway through an interview, with the BBC, actually, as an engineer... Right. ..I realised that this wasn't my the job I wanted, and although I had this idea of being on television, I wanted to be on the front of the television, not behind it. And getting a job on BBC Radio... Well, there's Earth. another interesting story further down with the element of food in terms of how you got into television as well. So, look, right. we've just got a duck over here. Oh, look, a little wow. bit of Chinese spice spice over the, over the top. You're just going to roast this in the oven. This small duck breast like this is only going to take probably four or five minutes in a nice hot oven, that's all. And why do you fry it first? To get the skin nice and crisp. Oh, OK. So you want to crisp up the skin. Uh, but look, and we've talked about this, 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 obviously, your radio career, but this, this is a fascinating story, how you got into television. This is this is what before is Holmes <laughs> and the Hammer, because you yeah, did yeah. stuff before then, which you... Yeah, well, I, was, I was working for the BBC, uh, uh, BBC Local Radio in Manchester, and it shared a building with the BBC TV. And one day at lunchtime... And this is an example <laughs> of how life can just pivot and you just don't know what's around the corner, which I think you can take very positively. But I was in the queue of the self-surface cafeteria, yeah. and there was, um, on the dessert section, a lemon meringue pie. And I just... I was having a laugh with the guy who was literally at the side of me with his tray as we were going down. We were laughing about the lemon meringue pie. And uh, as we were walking to the, the tills to pay, he said, oh, by the way, what do you do? And I went, oh, I was just working on the local radio downstairs. He said, oh, have you ever thought about doing TV? And I'm like, no. He goes, oh, if you ever fancy it, Peter, fifth floor. I'm like, OK. So, at the end of the day, my curiosity got the better of me and I phoned the reception at, uh, at Broadcasting House there and said, hey, is there somebody called Peter on the fifth floor? And they went, only Peter, head of television. And I'd literally been in the queue with the head of television for the BBC in Manchester. No idea who he is, nothing, no. nothing. We just laughed about lemon and lang pie and... I so, I phoned him up and he said, there was just something about you and I just thought... 
you know, if this guy's got something for TV. So like, this is what I... I you know, I, honestly, I read a lot of the history of our, our guests before you come up, but you have got a fascinating history how it all comes about. The and that... scary thing is, James, that all this stuff you couldn't actually plan. You, you know, couldn't I make couldn't, up, really. You had no, no idea. And so you just got to go... Again, you can look at life positively. Say, sometimes it looks like it's gone really bad, but somewhere around the corner, something really amazing you couldn't have predicted. Is and going talk to about amazing predictions, something's going to happen. I mean, homes under the hammer. We, we, I mentioned, you know, 20 years. That's nearly 20 years. It's 20 years later on this year. Yeah, no, 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 in a few, in a, in a few months. Yeah. 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 I mean, that's incredible. What, what do you put? What do you put the secret of its success to? Because you must get asked this quite a lot. But me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no. Well, I've done it since the start. Yeah. So, I, well, to be fair, I do know a lot about property because I'd always been doing property as a sideline to actually, you know, working as, unless you get to your dizzy heights. It, working in TV doesn't necessarily pay a lot of money. So, I'd always been involved in property, and that kind of paid for my <clears throat> enjoyable life as a, as a, as a, as in in the media. Um, and so. I, I, I've totally forgot my train of thought. It, it came about and it was just like, yeah, wow. I, I think I bring and have always brought a sense of um, a, a entertainment but also information to the show. So if you watch it, you do get a lot of take-home stuff. And it's not, you know, I love Kevin and Grand Designs, but a lot of that is, is really aspirational. The stuff that we do on Homes and the Hammock is really real. relatable. Yeah, it's and real. people, It's a two-up, two-down terrace. Yeah you know, in, in Stoke-on-Trent or whatever. And so people can say, I could do that. And a lot, I meet a lot of people who say, I have been inspired by that show to go on and... Um, and what amazes know. me is people buying stuff without them seeing it. Oh, no, that's a nightmare. Buying what, blind. What, what is that all I about? Know, I know. It's, I say to people, it's like crossing the road. You know, you could close your eyes and cross the road, and nine times out of ten, you won't get hit. But one time you do, it's going to really hurt. And um, that's the same with, with, with buying property blind. You have to go and see it, cos there's so much... You can't tell. Uh, and, uh, you know, a lot of, obviously, auctions now, a lot of them are online. Yeah. So there's even less potential or more potential that you might not visit a property before you buy it because it could be that you're looking at an auction in Aberdeen or, you know, in, in Portsmouth and you live in London or... It's like collecting stuff and buying ever... it off an auction site and not looking at it. Yeah, have We've you... all made that mistake. Well, yeah, we have, exactly. <laughs> yeah. uh, right, you, you'd it... never spend, you know, lots of money on a car without visiting it, no, would you? No, no. Well, no, would you? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, right. <laughs> uh, so we've just got here our sauce, and I'm just going to blend this up now. We just blend this, <sighs> blend it, blend it, blend it. We've got to blend this really, really well. So this is your like hoisin sauce, which is used on what? You can use this for all manner. You can use it as a dip. It's entirely up to you. But this is going to be served with our beautiful duck. Wow. So that's our nice little sauce. Now, as it go, as it cools down, it'll get thicker, of course, as well. So that's your nice little hoisin. The duck, which I've got in here, which I've coated it in that sort of Chinese five spice, and they just put a honey. You don't put honey on at the beginning, you put it on at the end. But you do love your job. You know, you get the feeling... You know, there's people on television that, 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 that you know, I've, 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 we've been doing it for a long time, both of us as well. Yeah. I think you've just got to love the actual fundamental job first before the... Get take TV away. Yeah. You've got to love the job of what it is you're talking about, don't <coughs> yeah. you think? Yeah, absolutely. I think so many people try and do it to be famous to find it, but... And I think the other thing that hopefully comes over in the show is, you know, I am passionate about property, and, you know, and, and I think the other presenters are as well. And I just think that comes over, hopefully. And, as I said, it, it's aspirational and, and gosh, yeah, I'm, I'm, who would have who would have thought it in the last 20 years? But it has, and long may it continue. Well, we're going to talk about everything you're doing as well later on as well <laughs> in the show, but... This is the little bit of duck. The hoisin over here, you can use this as a, a dipping sauce. Yeah, but see, even the way you splodge <coughs> that sauce on there. <coughs> the duck, you see, you can, you can separate this. I've got the chive oil. You can buy this nowadays, this chive oil, but... That's very green. And then you take your duck and you can see, very oh, simply, look, look. Beautiful. You can take a couple of pieces of that. <sighs> a few bits of the spring onion. Effortless. A little bit of the coriander over the top, like that. And then, finally, I just take a few, because a bit of texture, we take some mushrooms. What? You have raw mushrooms. Wow. You get this lovely little texture to go with it. So there you have it, my version of a little dish, duck with hoisin. Done.
I think you'll like this. I, 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 I think, wow. I think, I think you'll like this. <laughs> it looks absolutely <laughs> Dive into that. Let's have a taste of a bit of everything. Now, yeah, you can yeah. spice it up, a little bit of chilli in there if you wanted to, but... So you'd eat it with the, with the skin? Yeah, you eat the entire lot and you'd eat it with the sauce and... Mm, beautiful. It's very brave with the white shirt on, eating hoisin sauce to start off with, but there you go. <laughs> Good start to the day. There we go. There'll be more from Martin later on in the show. I'll be serving up a Jalfrezi spatchcock chicken with onion barges for rugby legend Scott Quinnell. But join us again after the break when chef Sabrina Gida will be shown as the ultimate brunch dish. I'll see you after the break. It's delicious. <laughs> it's nice, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Welcome back. Now, Welsh rugby legend Scott Quinnell will be stopping by for a feast very shortly, and I'll be showing you three different ways to use mayonnaise, and I'll be doing a little mayonnaise mass class. That's coming up in just a bit. But first, I'm here with Daniel Gamish, and together we're going to be joining a dish uh, from a chef whose skills have helped her in the kitchen become a two-time finalist in the world-famous Rue Scholarship. It's Sabrina Gida. Yay! Great to have you back. Thanks Great so to have you back. And congratulations with everything you're doing. Your career is flying and well-deserved. Well deserved. So what are you going to be making for us then? Um, for me, perfect hangover cure. We're going to have a little, um, which, you know, <laughs> it's the you off, might right? need on the weekend. <laughs> you might need. Right. Um, Who so, for? Me or him or you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I think we're two glasses down, oh, okay. aren't we? So maybe tomorrow. Right, okay. um, Alu gobi hash. So kind of classic flavours of alu gobi that you might know. But I've turned it into a hash. We're going to serve it with a beautiful fried egg and a really vibrant green chutney. OK, so the first thing you want me to do is do the potatoes. Yes, please. Yeah, that's... I'll tackle the cauliflower. Yeah. OK, that's... Um... so these are, these are just going to be cooked in... Just, just, just boiled, are they? And then these get added to the rest of what you're going to be doing now. Yeah, just to um, help with the cookery time a little bit. So um, plenty of nice salted water so that they're well seasoned. Okay. And then we'll get spicy afterwards to add some bits and pieces. Now, I first came across you when you did the, the Rue Scholarship. Yeah. Two-time finalist, like I said. You know, that set you up on your way as well. But you self-taught you were, you know, look at reading about you and bits and pieces. Is that, yes. Is that what you see yourself as? Uh, yes, just fueled by greed. And right. um, and I, I just love cooking. But um, but not been a chef. You wasn't wasn't it PR you started out of fashion, marketing and PR. Fashion PR. Yeah. People don't really eat in fashion though, James. So, <laughs> I was um, going to say that. Yeah. So how does that work? I learnt that quite quickly. That's yeah, for sure. No, um, sure yeah. But you know, I I mean, it was by fluke. I ended up in the kitchen, and um, and yeah, I started in contract catering, and then did two Rue scholarships. Um, and I always remember that moment with the mystery dessert box. And I just about blagged... Oh, that was the Rue Scholarship? Oh, my God. I just about blagged a shortbread recipe off the top of my head. And it, I laid it in the tray. The oven kept going off. And I turned around to take a... It was burnt around the edge, caramelised, let's say. Come on. Around the edges. And I remember thinking, I hope nobody sees me. I pulled it from the oven and I just saw James stood there like that. And I was like, oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God, it's burnt. And he saw. But, um... But it tasted delicious. So anyway, right, what have you got in here? You've boiled on ahead. What have we got in here? The little Sorry, florets so I've got, got in there. So I've got in. Um, yeah. So I'm going to make a little spice marinade for this. Yeah. Um, and then when the potatoes are done, we can we can add those to the party. So inside here, I've just got some chili. Um, we will. I'll be a bit reserved, chef. But seeds in because on, wait, he likes his chili. Just yeah. Daniel. Don't, don't, you know. No, I'm getting better. You're getting better. I'm getting better. Yeah, yeah. yeah, I don't yes. know whether... Yeah, yes. That's the right word to say, yeah, I think so, yes. Yeah. Um, now, now all this is relevant because, you know, you, you, you've you done the, the Rue Scholarship twice, now you're, I mean, your career's going from strength to strength, and now... Oh, she's here. <laughs> She's here. This, yep. this. I mean, your first book is a special book. You oh, know, you know. Yes. I mean, it's 30, it's 30, 30 years since my first book came out. No, surely not. It, it is. Trust me, it's thirty years. Uh, tell me about this then. So, I mean, it's a really special book, and it is the first book. Um, and I guess it's a sort of semi-autobiographical journey of the mixing of my Punjabi heritage with my classic French. Classic French. Uh, technique oh, that yes. I do oh, love. Oh, Dauphinoise, um, bravo. Coconut curry Dauphinoise. Uh -huh. But it's vegan. 
Yeah, perfect. So there you go. Uh, Everyone's happy. No, no, I like, I like all this. Yeah. So Fabulous. you know, it felt it felt like a great opportunity to, um, well, to celebrate being that mix of cultures, um, and it's dedicated to my late great wonderful mother, who basically inspired and she lit the fire for all things delicious. So yes, it's very special. Um, I've got to say, my father. I promoted from KP. He's now sous chef because he did all the prep for me in the kitchen. I was like, Dad, Dad. Dad. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, Mark, so on, yeah, yeah. He, um, <laughs> when we were recipe testing, I would come home with these sort of just all sorts of things, and he would just sit there very calmly and start peeling the garlic, doing the prep for me. He's smiling. You can see that's the, that's the beginning of the book. Yes. You haven't got yeah. a picture at the end of the book. That's <laughs> the like, yeah, because that's he was crying. Probably <laughs> no, fair. And apparently, um, you did it. In, was it three days? You did it. Five days. I like shot the. We we shot. Um, my gosh, the team. We shot ninety recipes in five days. Wow. Um, wow. Which is which is fairly yep. push push. So tiny. Message to my this. team here. That'll be yeah. There we go. <laughs> it took me three weeks to do mine. Oh my gosh. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it was very uh, push push. So we're there. I'm yeah. going to finish with a tiny little big on ginger. Yeah. And then we'll pop it on a tray. You, yeah, there you and, go. Um, ginger. Oh, I love ginger. Then we'll roast. Do you know, I thought wearing a white shirt made sense, and then the turn rate comes out. I'll do it, 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 I'll do it. So this goes in here, so... Perfect. But the, the first book is so special, isn't it? It I is. I mean, it's something... <gasps> well, really, it when it's out. I mean, I, I remember the... Um, oh, my James, you must as well. I mean, 30, uh, well, you see, you see, so I, I know what you'll be doing now. You'll be going around the supermarket, getting the book, and then putting it... Taking Jamie right. Oliver away. Yes, I've done that! <laughs> James, how did... <laughs> <laughs> That's going to happen. Sorry, David. Yeah, sorry. But Jamie's all of a sudden number wow. 26. Yes. Yeah. Oh, so good. <laughs> that, my <laughs> God. So good. <laughs> I'm glad you said that. I, I thought you just remind me. Oh, the best I way move to... so many books no, away. No, no, no the, the key to it is get your family to get some number five. Oh. They're all doing it. They're all doing it all over the country. Brilliant. Yeah. Exactly. Oh, I'll that's... just be moving it up. Just now you know, all over well, the place. Oh. I'm hoping it's going to be a real hit, because I love it. But that might skip me ahead a bit. But you see, head. nowadays I do it and I send Tom Carriage a picture. Now I <laughs> right. Um, oh God, so now right. it's all about the chutney, really. Yeah. So let's. Uh, would you mind just picking a little bit of mint for me, chef? Yeah. And maybe we'll. Um, I can do that. Yeah. We'll have a little swap. I can do that. Yeah. Um, so you can. Right. So this is a this is a classic style chutney Thank with you. that you've got in here. Yeah. So. Or your variant of a, of yeah, a classic style chutney. Yeah, and you see that a lot through the book. So there's there's riffs on classics, and then a couple of traditional French. There's a masala bouillabaisse in there that takes the. You know the best part of half a day to make. Because you are, so, you are, you're, you're classic. You're, you know, you're also. You, I mean, you mentioned the French classics. You do, you do, you know, absorb the French classics throughout the book yeah. as well. And you know, I had an Italian restaurant for three years, and I think it's exciting when you cook, being inspired by everywhere that you travel, really. So, mm -hmm. um, but the influence of classic French and. Um, and Italian cuisine yeah. is um, is very prevalent. So where are you now then? Tell everybody French. where you are now. Uh, so I, I actually run a consultancy, so I create food concepts and menus for, for brands. So and I've got a collection of. And when you're not there, you can be found in supermarkets oh, and bookshops doing this. Moving my book up to the top. <laughs> right. <laughs> exactly. yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. right. So what are we going to go with? Five once in a while. Yeah. Yeah. I can go and. Take I'll make it a tennis chef, but yeah. we'll, yeah. we'll yeah. do it properly. Yeah, yeah. Definitely. So what have you got in there then? Okay, so we've got equal quantities of coriander and mint, super delicious. Three chilies because we like a bit of punch. Um, yeah. I'm going to add <laughs> just a touch of ginger. Um, and then we'll get blending. Now, yeah. I'm on fried egg duty, then, you aren't are I? You are, chef. Right, OK. Yeah. If, I, if you don't mind, I, I like to put a little bit of butter out and oil yes, in my yes, fried yes, egg. Yes. Is that no, all right? That's quite all right. Well, we've got the Frenchman over here. It'd probably yeah, kick well. off. I just cooked it in oil, so... A little bit of that. Yeah. Do you know this tip? No. If you shake the egg, when you crack it in the middle... Yeah. ..the white, uh, the yolk stays perfectly in the centre. Well... Fact, Every you've got to shake it a bit more. Oh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> and not let it go. <laughs> hey? But yeah. Okay, so Look at that. a touch Look. of water. Wow. Yeah, because it moves from It's always off centre yeah. anyway, yeah. yeah. Look at that. Yeah, perfect. Amazing. There you Probably go. Egg. Every day's okay. a school day. There we go. There you so go. we'll have a little blend. <laughs> Put it in book two, that you see. <laughs> <laughs> Noted. Credit. Credit exactly, though. Exactly, yeah. Right. Lovely. Do you, do you want crispiness to your... To yes, your... Yes. Yeah, I thought you might. Frilly egg, please, chef. Um, microplane would be in here, would it? Uh, that'll be in here. Lovely. 
Thank you. Lovely. Yeah. So, have a little blend so how long are you roasting that one off? So I'll take I'll take the ones yeah. out of the oven for you. So how long? We've so, got some that have been roasting here, so people can see. Lovely. So you want to do it for about 15, 15 minutes or so. But really, when you get all this gorgeous kind of burnish, some people kind of barbecued. Yeah, and you get, that's where the flavour comes any. from. Absolutely. Yeah. So I um, like that. You see, I prefer than, than getting on a casserole for me. I guess. Yeah, because it a bit gives of crunch. this nuttiness and crunchiness on it. I think so. Right, Lovely. so we're nearly there with this, so, so I'll let you Fair. plate up. OK, great. So ah. I'm just going to have a little um, finish, little fresh freshness here. Um, tiny squeeze of lemon. I just love that. OK, so let's go in. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm so pleased that you said that you like coriander because... Oh, yeah, me too. We'd be in I trouble love, otherwise, I wouldn't we? So, I love it. I love it. OK, fab, so... Let's have a little touch of. It's so simple. That's the great thing of this. Yeah, Just I roast mean, it in the oven. it's easy. Exactly, and it's perfect if you want it on the side of your roast lunch, if you want to mix things up a bit. But it's big flavour. It's really easy. Yeah, but the dish on its own. You see, that's why I like uh, uh, your vegetarian style of food. It's just amazing. Yeah. Did you want the fried egg on before the the chutney? Yes, please, chef. Okay. That would be great. Lovely. There you go. Just aware of my turmeric cans on your tea towels there. Um, That's all right. Oh, lush. Happy with that? Yes, thank you. I'll have a Go little on. spoon. OK, lovely. So... Right, if that doesn't get you back on the straight and narrow... Um... <laughs> I prepare myself. I'm just, I'm just, like, breathing carefully. Yeah, I'll just, just check that... That's it. So we've got... Ooh! Yeah, yeah, well, there you go, you see? <laughs> That's what I wanted you to try first, so I just... <laughs> just, got, like, <laughs> just got a French where uh, you destroy his palate. Ooh. So, go so on, we've got um, aloo gobi hash, fried egg and green chilli chutney. Absolutely oh, brilliant. Super. There you go. <laughs> Chef. There we oh, are. Oh, lovely. <laughs> so, do I need to be careful with the chili, or is that? I would say proceed with caution. Um, <laughs> but uh, I think you'll love it. Yeah. So. <laughs> well, I love I love vegetarian dishes anyway, so that's not a problem. So. No, this is this is lovely. Yeah, little punch, you know, it's fresh. Lovely. It, ne it needs it, and it, you like you like you say. Absolutely, because of the potatoes. You need with the vinegar yeah. works really well instead of the yogurt. It's, it's brilliant. Mm. Happy oh, with that, Mr. Frenchman? Happy. Yeah. Actually, That's one happy Frenchman. Very good. There you go. It's brilliant, that. Super. Sabrina, everybody! Yeah. Brilliant, brilliant. Well done, well done. You don't need to call me chef anymore. You're all right. Oh, all right. got it. Uh, I'll be showing you how to make mayonnaise three ways in this week's Little Mask Us. But join us again after the break, where we're serving an entire spatchcock Jalfrezi chicken from Welsh rugby star Scott Quinnell. I'll see you after the break. Very nice. It's delicious, that. Fab. Welcome back. And this week's Masterclass is all about mayonnaise and what you're going to do with it. And also, we've got some fantastic food on the way from Mr Daniel Gawamish later on this morning. Daniel's here with us for this next bit because he's a big fan of this gentleman's sport. Uh, this gentleman is a true giant of the rugby world. He reached the pinnacle of his sport with his performances for Wales and the British and Irish Lions. It's the brilliant Scott Quinnell! Yeah. Wonderful to have you there. Thank you. Cheers. You've got to do Cheers. Cheers. And, and welcome to the house because Thank you. every Saturday, it seems to be every Saturday noon, I get this, I get a random message on social media and text message going, I've messed that up, I've tried that, how did it, what's going wrong? Sent me a picture and we turn up the heat more butter i know that's all that's that's all the advice is turn up the heat more butter <laughs> <laughs> that's it. but it's good to have you as well i mean i've got to say and you're a big fan you're a big rugby fan as well because you're you're here as well i've got to say i mean what an amazing career you can't have imagined this as a, as a, as a career going on to what you're doing. But when, it, when you look back at it, and you look at back at your family, it was in the blood, though, isn't it? I mean, that... that yeah, well... Well, it's, it's in the blood. Oh, no, it's definitely in the blood, yes. My how father. many of your family and, and your, your brothers and all that sort of stuff... Are... Oh, uh, my, my, my father was a three-time British Lion. 
Uh, he played for Wales, played for the Barbarians. Uh, 50 years ago, the try, my father gave the pass to Gareth Edwards to score the try up the left-hand corner against the All Blacks, the greatest try in the last oh. century. <laughs> uh, my father was uh, just absolutely incredible. My mother's brother, or my uncle, we call him Ishleki, yeah. was uh, Barry John. Right. Uh, it was the, the outside half known as the king. Can I just say he's French? He's got no understanding of what you've just said for no, the last no, I do. <laughs> Day second. I do. I do. <laughs> <laughs> That's OK. We do understand each other. But go on, then. Because to, to do it... I mean, there must be a little bit of a brothery competition, though. Are they ready? Yeah. Well, I'm the, I'm the smallest one. So my, my brother, Craig, Craig, played 36 times uh, for Wales. My younger brother, Gavin, uh, he played for the Scarlets. He played for Worcester. And, uh, you know, my, my godfather was Merv the Swerve Davis, one of the greatest number eights ever to, to play for Wales. Uh, I think I worked it out a couple of years ago. I, I, I'm the seventh best rugby player in my family. Wow. So, I don't know, I, why I'm here today, I have no idea, really. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I have no idea. So, we're gonna do a, we're gonna do a little Jal Frazy. I was gonna mention this top of the show, but we've gone straight into it. But I know you're a big fan of your food. We talked about that anyway. But I thought I'd do you a little chicken Jal Frazy. So, oh, it starts with... Fried onions, peppers. I've got some different spices over here. So we've got cumin, coriander, turmeric, ginger, garlic, some curry leaves, tomatoes at its base. Uh, this is normally not in Jalfrezi where you spatch cook the chicken. Usually it's Jalfrezi is like a stir fry, really, where you add the chicken pieces to the pan and everything else. This we're going to do uh, with yogurt, and I'm doing this with some nice onion barges with it as well. But playing for your team in Wales, I mean, how how does it go about? Then you end up. Playing the pinnacle. It, what is the pinnacle? Is that the the, the tour, the, the the Lions tour? Is that is that really the pinnacle of the sport, or it's got to be playing for Wales? Sure, you know, it's got to be. Yeah. Do you know what? Well, grow, grown up, I struggled in school. You know what I mean. And the only thing that gave me self-esteem right. was um, was rugby. And coming through the school system, you know, you, you told you're thick, you're stupid, you're lazy, because I was dyslexic. I didn't find out till many years later. About similar to when I was. I was yeah. about in my late mid, mid to late thirties when I found it. You were about yeah, the same. Yeah, I, well, I, I was 36 when I actually got diagnosed with it. But I was 21 when my wife was typing out a thesis for a friend who was in uh, university, and she said, "Scott," she said, "You do this, and you do this." She said, "You do this." She said, "Scott, you're dyslexic." And I said, well, yeah, before well, he wasn't recognised, that's yeah. the thing, yeah? As yeah. Well, they ignored it. It's so, it was so, you know, so all of a sudden, I sort of kind of knew I was, but then I got diagnosed at 36, and the night before I was going to get diagnosed, I genuinely thought to myself, what if I'm not dyslexic? Then I'm thick, stupid and lazy, like they told me when I was at school. And then when they said, Scott, you're dyslexic, you've got to read at the age of five, I was like, yes! <laughs> and they said, well, well, why are you so happy? I said, well, because at least I know now why I'm like this, you yeah, know? And, yeah, exactly, and it's yeah. fabulous, you know? I know a lot of people who are dyslexic, I know a lot... Of, and if people are struggling with dyslexia out there at the moment, right, that's all I say is ask for help. Don't struggle alone, yeah. just ask for help. Especially if you're younger, because that is so important. It is, because, I mean, yeah, like when to. we were kids, they would pigeonhole it. And even... I, I remember doing this now, uh, and somebody, uh, social, somebody on social media contacted me, and they were so upset that they're... they're daughter had just come back from school, they were in tears, and somebody had told them exactly the same thing. It was actually one of the teachers had told them that. Yeah. And you're which not good enough, you need to be that. Which yeah. is just, I mean, so then I sent back a message of all the famous people who are dyslexic. Yeah. And, so, I mean... Oh. Yeah, the 20, I think something so like many, it used yeah. to be 20% of, the, of the, the people that own billion uh, pound companies yeah. uh, are dyslexic. And, yes. you know, Richard Branson was one of the famous ones. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know, and he said before, you know, he would not want to be dyslexic because he thinks that improves the, his thinking. Because well, he thinks outside the box because he yeah. can't get in it. You know, right. <laughs> I, th I, th I think that's a wonderful way of putting it. It is a great way of putting it, but it's, it's, you know, it certainly hasn't stopped you as, as well. And, and what I love about you, really, you played for all these clubs, uh, uh, but you still, you know, you still crave for playing for the club that you originally started at, didn't you? Yeah, really? no, totally. <laughs> but playing for Schlecht, yeah, I, I remember. And you, you, the question uh, I think was before you actually put the chicken in was, yes. uh, <laughs> what was, you know, what what was the pinnacle? And and the pinnacle was, it was. My first ever game for Schlechy, and I stood in the change room in Pennegross Rugby Club. It was it was a centenary match, and I stood there as an 18-year-old, right? And I thought to myself, I finally made it. I stood and at pasties and drunk shandies yeah. on the touchline for so long yeah. that I'm finally on the pitch. And that day, I thought to myself, do you know what? 
I could do this. One thing that I love about rugby players as well, because they're, they're amazing communicators. I've been fortunate to go to black tie dinners and bits and pieces, and you see you guys, the after dinner speaking and the communication, where does that come from? Where, where does... So is that the love of the look, team sport? Is, where, yeah. where does that... I would think, where, how, do, how does that happen? Where does that come from? Well, I go back to the dyslexia now, the fact that when I retire... But you're very confident, you know? When... Yeah, but it, it's all... It's all... It's not an act, because it, 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 it's all about that self-esteem. The, the yeah, day that it changed yeah. for me is when Graham Henry asked me to actually... Uh, Captain Wales, and I and I looked at him, and I was I was screaming in my head, yes, 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 and I thought, okay, I desperately want to do it, but I've got to stand up in the aftermatch reception and speak to the crowd. Now playing in front of seventy-two thousand people was easy. Speaking in front of a hundred people. I was, I don't know if I could do it. So I, I said, yes, I will. And I run back to my room and I phoned Nicola. I said, Nick, I've done something. She said, what have you done? Yes. I said, I'm Captain Will. Amazing. I said, yeah, but I've got to speak after. She said, Scott, worry about that after the game. After the game, yeah. And I stood up after and I said a few words and then I Captain Wales a couple of years later, full time. And then, and then I, afterwards then, if anybody tells you getting up and speaking in front of people is easy, they're lying. Because when I first started doing it, when, 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 I, when I first started doing it, I was terrified. Yeah. I wouldn't eat my food. I'd go, I'd go to a dinner, I wouldn't eat my food. I, I was so... Now, I have something on the way there, and I have the food that's there, you know what I mean? It's, it's, it's lovely, you know, you, you yeah. learn to be able to... Well, look, the, yeah, we're, we're only... We're only if, if you love that chat, we're only a percentage of the way into it, because you've got to stick around all morning for us as well, so... Uh, you've got to, to the end of the show, but look, this is your Jal Frazee. It's a nice bit of spice. I've done you a small portion, if that's all right. Your, your chicken... Yeah, it's just only a half. What are you having? What yeah. are you having? Well, I don't know what you... <laughs> <laughs> it all depends what you're leaving me. <laughs> but I'm going to take this sort of Jal Frazee sauce and put it all over the top. Which, like I said, usually with this, you fry off the chicken and the spices and everything in there. But this is tomatoes, green peppers in there as well. Oh, God, eggs. But do you know that, though? I, I love chicken, but I, I enjoy it on the bone. I think it yeah, just adds too. that oh, flavor. So much, exactly. so much better. There you go. So well, much flavor. A little bit over that. And there we have it. My version of a chicken chalfrezi for when a rugby player comes round to your house. Oh, yeah. Easy as that. Can I clap? Can I clap? <laughs> <laughs> that is my name, is it? I'm going to put it in the middle, oh. and you can help yourself. Ooh. Start one side each. Oh, wow. There you go. Oh, wow. oh. There you go. <laughs> Which side do you want? Me. Sweet quarter and I have the wings. Oh, or... I love that bit. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Let's just try this. Let's just try nice. this. It's a bit of, bit of spice in it. It's mm. just so fresh, isn't it? Nice, isn't it? Especially when you do it like that. You know, you, you can. That's what it's deemed as. It's like an like a Indian version of a stir fry, but the chicken pieces can be di diced and put in. Mixture as well. I've just well, actually, no, the balance is really good. I think the balance is really nice. Very with the nice. And everything else. We don't like mm. it too hot, but good. Well, I'm going to show you how to make, how to cook a steak with metrotel butter a little bit later. That dish that I told you to put more butter in it, and get it even hotter. Uh, right, we're serving up a second course, like I said, a sirloin steak with metrotel butter from Martin and Scott at the end of the show, and I'll be handing over the hobs to this gentleman over here, Daniel Galmish, very shortly. But join us after the break. We've got masters in mayonnaise that you definitely don't want to miss. I'll see you then. Bye for now. Very good. Welcome back. Now we're treating my guests, Scott Quinnell and Martin Roberts, to steak very shortly. But first, it's time for this week's Little Masterclass. And this week's Masterclass is all about mayonnaise. You've seen me make this many, many times on TV, but not actually had a little class of how you actually make it. I've always done it as a sort of sideline. So we've got in here eggs, we've got mustard, always, always, always vegetable oil. Never olive oil. Sorry, Gino, but it's never olive oil ever in the history of mayonnaise. It's vegetable oil, all right? So that's that. And vinegar, so white wine vinegar. There is some acid in there. It can be vinegar, it can be a little bit of lemon. So how do you start it? So first of all, what we need is egg yolks for this. So we keep the egg whites, of course, because we can utilise those as well. But we've got the egg yolks in here. Now you want really, really good, fresh 
egg yolks in there because mayonnaise is made out of raw egg yolks. Now, there are options you can make, not necessarily with mayonnaise, but there is a thing called salad cream, which is made not with raw egg yolks that I'm doing over here. It's actually made with hard-boiled egg yolks. So you, what you do is hard-boil the eggs, you then peel them, you'd eat the whites, put the yolks in there and make this exactly the same way, exactly the same way, apart from right at the end, you just put a little bit of cream in, you've got yourself some salad cream. So this decent amount of mustard, a good chunk of Dijon mustard, always Dijon, never English mustard, far too strong. Then we take some vinegar. So you can see it's kind of like that sort of hollandaise base, whereas you're whisking this over the top, you'd start off with a, a sort of gastric, they call it, this reduction of uh, usually white wine or, 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 or vinegar, reduced down with shallots and peppercorns and that kind of stuff. And, but we're just going to touch a touch of vinegar in there. Now what we need to do is to start to emulsify the egg yolks and the mustard up. So that's why you need a machine that keeps blending. Don't have one that you keep your finger on it all the time. Just keep blending it like this. And what you want to do is emulsify those ingredients together with the oil. Now, you'll be amazed how much oil goes into mayonnaise. And I've got some egg yolks in here. It will take this entire bottle and that again, and probably again, if I wanted it to. So what you want to do is you want to start off quite slowly. Now, if you add the oil too quickly, it will split and separate the mayonnaise. And you'll notice that if it's not emulsifying and coming together as a nice little sauce <coughs> and it looks quite bitty, almost like a really fine scrambled egg, what you've got to do with that is drain off this mixture into a bowl, put some egg yolks into the bowl again and pour the split mixture carefully back into the machine. Now, the reason why we use a vegetable oil and not an olive oil is that we want mayonnaise to be one of the base sauces. So it's what you add to it that makes it into what they call the daughter sauces from the mother sauce. So I'm going to then do sort of derivatives from this. But this is how you make it, first of all. Now, you can see as it gets thicker and thicker and thicker, and now we can start to add more and more and more. Now, the misconception is that the more oil you add, the thinner it gets. It's actually the opposite. The more oil you add, the thicker it gets. And the way you knock that back and make it a smoother mayonnaise it's just the addition of water. So a little bit of water, or you add other ingredients that I'm about to add now. But you can see the volume's increasing. I'm just going to show you what's happening in here. So then we can lift this out. So you can see, you can see it's getting thick, which is exactly what we want it to be. That's that texture. <coughs> now we keep going. Get rid of that. And we'll get more and more and more. Now, while that's happening, I'm going to multitask for this one because I'm going to take a little bit of this and I'm going to get a fi some fish in the pan. So we're going to take some nice bit of salmon. I'm just going to roast this in there because this is going to be one of the derivatives that I'm going to serve this with. A little bit more oil, like that. A bit of salt and pepper. That one. And then we start to pan fry that. Now we can keep on going. So again, gradually, 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 as we go like this. So you see the volume's increasing. Now you see how much oil I've used. I mean, one egg yolk roughly could probably absorb half a liter of oil, something like that. I mean, in the restaurant, we're doing this in bigger volumes, probably doing 16, 20 liters of oil in there, and probably using a, a dozen egg yolks, something like that. But you can see as you're mixing it, it gets thicker and thicker and thicker. That's what we want there. So it gets thicker and thicker and thicker and thicker. And you can see... This is the mixture. You probably had a little bit too much at the time, but then it'll keep coming back. Keep going and going and going. A whole bottle of oil, look. All of it gone. Right? So that's your nice little bit of a mayonnaise. I can stop that machine now. Then I'm going to take a little bit of butter. I'm going to just pop this in the oven for a second. So that's a nice little bit of salmon. Because this is going to be one of the derivatives from this sauce with this nice little bit of fish. You can have it hot or cold. So, what do you, what, how do you make this into sort of different derivatives from this? So first of all, we'll get a bit of mayonnaise. So, 
Obviously, I've seasoned this as well. A bit of black pepper and a bit of salt. And there you have your classic sort of mayonnaise. Easy as that. Now, if you want it smoother, a little bit of, little bit of uh, water, I'll just show you. So if you take a little bit of water in this, mix this together, you'll see you get this classic colour. And you see straight away we've got that classic style mayonnaise now, one that you're so familiar with. And that's that one. Done. So a simple little mayonnaise. Then there are other options from this. So we're going to do one. I mean, this is this. I love this one. This is just the, this is one of my favourites. To be honest with you, it's a little blue cheese dressing. Very simple. We just need a little bit of the mayonnaise. So just a touch of the mayonnaise. Dollop of that. This isn't one of the classic sort of daughter sauces, uh, but this is sort of my version of stuff. So equal quantities mayonnaise and creme fraiche. Like that. So a good dollop of creme fraiche. This is if you want a really nice blue cheese dressing. Mix that together. Blue cheese, whatever you want. I've just... You can use whatever blue cheese you want, really. Um, Dolt cheese, something like that, but it's entirely up to you. But a little bit of blue cheese in here. Like that. We mix that together. And then I add a touch of lemon. So a tiny little bit of lemon to this. A little bit of that. And then you want some Worcester sauce or, or I use a little bit of Henderson, but a little bit of that in there. Mix that together. Now, see, it's quite thick. So again, what we do, we utilise the water to bring it down. So don't be frightened to put water in it. A little bit of water will help. So a touch of salt and pepper over the top. And then very quickly, you can have a, a, a blue cheese dressing. So. We've got our lettuces over here. I mean, I've got some lovely lettuce. We'll just take a little bowl, but... And then it works with any lettuce, but what I like doing when I sort of do a blue cheese salad at home... So I love these butterhead lettuces. I just think they're just fantastic. So what I do with this is just take it, cut it into quarters, and sit it in the middle, like that. And then almost do the same with the other bits. So I'll put it in and let it break open like that. And then you can do this with, I mean, I've done this with smoked dock and bits and pieces, you can slice it, but these are amazing with it. These are little pecan nuts that I've caramelled. I've just put a bit of sugar in a pan, caramelised them, and then put the pecan nuts in and you caramelise these. And when they're still hot and you put them on the tray, you just sprinkle them with a bit of sea salt. But they're... They've got like these caramelised pecans, they're delicious. A little bit of bread, crouton-wise. We can then break up that into croutons, like that. And then you can take your blue cheese dressing. So together with a little bit of blue cheese, you want to sprinkle over the top. You see how quickly you've got yourself a meal? And you've actually made the dressing, that's the great thing about this. You know, take the... There you go. And you can turn this mayonnaise into sort of a ranch-style dressing if you want. Another one you can do is... Uh, and this is a really nice one. This is particularly this time of year. You have blood oranges. Um, and these are one of the derivatives from, from uh, the Hollandaise sort of thing. This is, this is called Maltese. So Maltese is a, is a, is a, is a beautiful, beautiful uh, Hollandaise or mayonnaise made with the addition of blood orange. Blood orange juice, and look at the colour of that. And you mix that together, and it turns pink. Look. And this is a great, great mayonnaise that you can serve with salmon. You can have this hot or cold. You can also serve it with asparagus. It's delicious. Um, but it's wonderful with sort of cold fish, really, and, and vegetables. It's really nice. So again, we'll season this like that. Mix that together. Now you could, of course, just put just lemon in it if you wanted to, but the blood orange, what it does is this little beautiful pink colour turns it glorious. You could put grapefruit in this if you wanted to as well. It's entirely up to you. So take one of those mother sauces and do what you want really with it. But you've got your blood oranges like this. 
which we can just peel like that. An amazing colour from these. And then you can take a few slices of the blood orange. You can do segments if you want, it's entirely up to you, but either way. And then of course you can grab your plate. You can take your blood oranges like that. And then you've got your nice little bit of salmon, which we can lift out nearly. Embarrass myself. Bit of that on there. And then the dollop of the, the uh, blood orange mayonnaise with it. So you can have that hot or cold, a little bit of salad, stuff like that. And I suppose one of the ultimate ones that people sort of take for granted, really, with when they're doing mayonnaise and bits and pieces is the classic Mary Rose, seafood sauce, really. The easiest way to do that is have it in the machine. And you've got it going in the machine, and now it's the addition of several things. Now, you, when I make a sort of a, a Mario sauce, usually people just make it with mayonnaise and they make it with ketchup. Yes, it has got ketchup in it, so we'll add a little bit of this, but I think it's the addition of other stuff that makes it important. So, nice little bit of ketchup. Then, we we'll use some Tabasco. Here we go, bit of that. This is the key to it, brandy. Brandy into it. Touch of lemon juice, like that. Salt and pepper. And then blend. And this will give you your classic Mary Rose sauce. Which will lift it off. And then when you obviously serve it, you have to serve prawn cocktail in a cocktail glass. It's just a necessity, it's got to be done. Lettuce, good idea to slice this all up because Granny can never eat it out of this if it's not sliced up. Bit of that. You've got your beautiful prawns. Thing on there. One for me, one for the pot, like that. And then you sauce. That's your Mary Rose sauce, look. Your classic, classic Mary Rose sauce. And like any prawn cocktail, it's got to be done with mustard cress. A little bit of paprika or cayenne. And the stereotypical prawn on the side. The hanger of prawn on there. So there you have it. Now you know how to make mayonnaise and three different sauces from it. Easy as that. <laughs> now, if there's anything you'd like to learn about a little mask, I didn't get in touch with you, so if we can help out right here on the show. Time now for a quick break, but join me again in a couple of minutes with the brilliant chef, the Frenchman Daniel Galmiche, will be making an amazing dish using monkfish and mussels. I'll see you in a bit. Welcome back. Now, I'll be trying to impress my guests, Martin Roberts and Scott Quinnell, with a sirloin steak with maitre d'hôtel butter. That's coming up very shortly. You like it now, aren't you? Of course, uh, yes. But first, <laughs> I'm joined by Sabrina. And we're looking forward to a dish from this man, mm, exactly, yeah. uh, who started out life in the French countryside and was taken the world by storm with his culinary expertise. It's, of course, Daniel Gamish. Thank you. Now, what if I have you back? What are you with a monkfish? The, yes. The French love it, don't they? I love it. Yeah, I think it's yeah. brilliant. It's versatile. It's very meaty, so you can treat it like meat, almost. Yeah. We're going to get two pieces out of it on the bone, which yeah. is actually a cartilage, and we're going to roast it and give a beautiful flavour. Okay. Well, nice. I know okay. you're going to start portioning so, this, this yeah. on the bone as well. So, I'll, I'll make sure the pan's nice and hot for you. And it's lovely to cook fish on the bone, isn't it, really? I prefer. I think the flavour is all around it, and the cartilage is going to give so yeah. much goodness. And the interesting thing about monkfish, there's nutty. only one main bone in it. It's not a little, little, little bone That's it, off yeah. It, yeah. What you need to get rid of is the skin outside, obviously. But uh, for people who never use 
monkfish before. I mean, we can cook it like this, but you can take all the fillet off. Do you want to cut another piece, just in case? Yeah, if you want. I'm just thinking, Johnny the cameraman, two, on two okay. over there, mate, you know. There you go. Have they, they, have a go at that? Yes. Good, so Beautiful. that's a nice little bit. And it's interesting yeah. with monkfish, they used to use this as scampi way back, when, when longsteins became so expensive. The and then they yeah. used to use it, but obviously that became more expensive and then gone, yeah. gone back onto longsteins now. So, so we're going to roast that gently. Now, you know I love France, but the area of France that you, you've come from, I particularly love. Tell us about the area about where you were brought up, because that, that is France, a gastronomic capital. France, co France Comté. Yeah. Bourgogne France Comté now, because it's, yeah. it's uh, together two county. Uh, yes, a lot of... Uh, Beautiful produce. But it's not just that, you have the, you have the mountains. Mountain, you, you, lakes. You have lakes, forests. Forest. Yeah, you have all manner of different sort of things there, don't you, really? That's the great thing about it. Okay, well, to give them really nice colour. Yeah. And finish in your oven later on. Okay. And use a muscle and do that. Okay. And so I was talking about the area that you come from. That's the, the famous Comte cheese. Comte cheese, so that's why you've got the Comte, the Vacheron Mondor, oh. yeah. the Morbier. And we got this beautiful uh, poulet au vin jaune because that's the way yeah. area of uh, what we call the vin jaune, the wine, Savagnin, yeah. Pupillin. Although now we, it's a group of two regions, which is Bourgogne and Franche Comté. Yeah. But people always fight against Bourgogne in Franche Comté because they think <laughs> there's more attention to Bourgogne because of their lovely wine yeah. and not enough in Franche Comté, but yet in a mountain where I live Raymond Blanc, as you, you know, on, on yeah. that side and me on the other side. It's a country, I mean, the charcuterie, the, the meat, the sausage, the, the smoke, pork, the... Yeah. Oh, wow. So this is where we want a decent amount of salt you want to put in with the, yes. the, the potatoes as well, so... Good amount of seasoning on there. And then you just bring that to the boil and gently cook that yeah. and turn it off and we've got it on there. Correct. Yeah, yeah. A little bit of saffron. Yes. It's gone in there as well, OK? OK. Right, yeah. monkfish. Do you so use much monkfish in your cooking? I do. I mean, it's a luxury ingredient, isn't Price it? It varies, doesn't it, really? That's it well, varies, uh, but... yes. I mean, luxury, yes and no, because depending on the season, yeah. and that's the reason I'm doing it today, because it is affordable, and you can see, I mean, there's big it's, portion. You can really serve quite beautiful. a few people. Yeah. But it can be, as you said, it's true. Depending on the season, it can be expensive. And if you know a good, a good fishmonger, he can tell you when the season friends, buys the right tail. Like friends in all the right places. It's um, kind of that but as well. But it's great yeah. because you can... I cook it a lot when I make curries at home as well. It's, yeah. um, it really stands up to spice, which I think is really yeah, good. Yeah, well, that's because of the meatiness of it. Yeah, that's, I mean, it stands up to spice, but also you're saying, I mentioned earlier, it stands up to, a, you know, that you can do classic beef sauces with it. It's versatile, it's it great. Is, it is amazing. It's so good yeah. that I'm going to keep that. That's going in my fridge for my supper tonight. <laughs> oh, right. Oh, shame. I want, yeah. Yeah, no, that's going with me. That's oh, right, OK. <laughs> so I let him there. Right, and then you're going to transfer it onto a tray and then just pop and it in the oven. Yeah. Right? Just one more minute, and after that, we should be OK. Huh? So just colour on both sides, then? Yeah, I want to give it a touch more colour there. Now, there you've been go. travelling all over the place recently. I have as well. a little bit, yes. Yeah. Yes, I'm just back from Dubai last night. Yeah, actually. Literally last night. <laughs> literally last night, yeah. Um, no, a really interesting place, uh, because the difference now, it's not anymore a stopover, it's a destination. Have you been over there working? Oh, I, uh, not to work, to holiday. Right. But it is, it's such a vibrant place, isn't it? So oh much happening. So a lot of, uh, a lot of, uh, 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 top chef, a lot of chefs, basically, yeah. are going now to set up things, and since Michelin is in the place, and that's yeah. the reason I was brought in, because, uh, <laughs> um, working for a restaurant called Doze. Right. Uh, really interesting. It's a Mediterranean concept. Uh, a lot of uh, things made in front of the customer. Yeah. Uh, flambé and uh, sea bass in rock salt and all this kind of stuff. And uh, so we, we, we're going to try to... Now, are you going to use No, I'm going to use it for the muscle. Can I yeah. use a little bit of this butter then? Too? Oh, yes. Oh, it's a bit So it's a bit yeah. where you say a little bit of butter and well, then I, I watch know. the <laughs> <laughs> every time. Well, no substitute for it, as the Frenchman will know. Yeah. Right, I'm going to crank up your pan for you. James, if you can cut some uh, chilli for me. OK. Do you want uh, this just bruised sliced through? Yeah. Quite thin slice, but not too many, because... The strength is lovely, but for my palate, it's not that great. Not the Frenchman's palate, you don't no, want too much? Not too much. Just bruise that for me a little bit, yeah? yeah. No, I'll chop it. And chop a little bit, and... Superb. There you go. Yeah, in it like that. This one, too. A touch of ginger. It's easier if I use this. Yeah. Touch of saffron here. Well, that's better. Exactly. That's yeah, messing around, ruining my knife. Sorry about that. You got yeah, a nice, nice clean white shirt on. Perfect. <laughs>
Right, there, there you go. Uh, right, that goes in. Here. Bit of ginger. A bit of ginger there, with a touch of cream. All right. I'm going to cook that slowly, all together. Ginger? Yes. Wow, okay. beautiful. What's that? And then you're just going to bring that... Now, what is it about chervil and you... Every time you come on here, you, you want this uh, chervil. Because it what is, is... What is it about just chervil? <laughs> incredible flavour. Incre right. It's a touch of anise in it. It's nutty, it's fresh. Boy, that I don't use everywhere. Now, don't get me wrong. I, don't, <laughs> I know when I come on, on the show, I do. I've been to your house. There's, there's, you've got it by the side of the bath. It's in the shower. <laughs> <laughs> Can you imagine that, yeah? <laughs> Let right. me put that so on. I'll just fire that up a little bit. Yes. Yeah, it's on. And then this. Look, the fish is it almost there. Almost there, yes. I don't want to keep it too, too much. You need a little bit more, though. Maybe eh? about another 30 seconds, a minute? Yeah, maybe a minute and a half, maybe even. Eh? Minute and a half. Yeah. Right. Like that. So, and that is ready. Let me test that because that. Oh, I love that. It's so good. Do you want some chopped chervil? <laughs> I will have some chopped chervil at the end, <laughs> but okay. Wow, chili, are you? Yeah. Uh, you like chili? Why you put it in? I, well, I was, yes. But I've just realised it's... Is it too hot for the Frenchman? Huh? It's too hot for the Frenchman? You know. It's, it's destroy la palate. Yes. There you go. No, it's all right, actually. It's going to be delightful. That's that in there. But uh, we mentioned France, and what I still love about France is you kept this... And when you go to any town, village, or anything else like that, you haven't got supermarkets taking over everywhere else. There's not a supermarket on the corner. You've managed to keep the butcher, the fishmonger, the, yes. the baker. Yeah. And the market. That's what's so week. vital. Do you and think that's what... And it's such pride, isn't it? I yeah. just love that as well, when you travel. And you know, it's, it's the best of the best, the best yeah. bread. And you see someone Quite. specifically about the product, and it is just sensational, isn't But it? also there is, because where I live, I mean, it's, it's still quite rural, you know? I come out of my town, 11,000 people, I'm straight in a mountain, whatever. The market is every Tuesday. All the villages come down, it's and it's a, it's a week of meeting, having a coffee reunion, having a croissant deep in your and thing, and chat over the... But even I mean, down to the markets, really there's nice. this, this respect for everybody at the market. Oh, yes. You haven't got w one person selling cabbages and another guy selling cabbages. You haven't got one, you know... They, no, they don't, they don't sell the same, correct. Yeah. That's the great thing about it, isn't it? I love it, and they're all friends. They all meet every week. Oh, salut, I haven't seen you for a while, how are you? And brilliant. <laughs> Right, there's so your fish. I'm, well, what I'm going to do there, you know, I'm going to look at the colour. Mm. I'm going to add a touch of it in here, just to take a little bit of the edge on the chilli. And the spoon. <clears throat> and... <laughs> just to take the edge on the chilli. <laughs> 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 like a little side glance there. Uh, well, look, look at the colour. We're ready. Yeah. There you go. Two dishes we're going to do, shall we? Yeah. I, I, I just keep it on a bone, OK? On a bone like this. Love it when he goes. He goes. He goes restaurant. Restaurant. He goes all quiet. And concentration. Yeah, this, is, yeah. this is the moment. Yeah, I'm isn't going it? to clean the. Don't worry. Ah, oh, okay. Let's not be quite right. Let's <laughs> not. <laughs> okay. May as well. Okay. So vibrant. I love this. Okay. Let's put another one. Like that. OK. Where's the potatoes going? Potatoes. I'm going to put yeah. a couple on the side in here. Just there. You're quite good at this, aren't you, Chief? I'm trying to remember what I've been teached by uh, <laughs> Monsieur Michel <laughs> Houssigny. Otherwise, if he's, if he's watching from where he's now, he will... Daniel, remember what I told you, yeah? <laughs> So give us the name of this dish. So roasted monkfish with saffron chili and lemongrass, mussel ragu, and some saffron potatoes. Goodbye, but a bit of a legend. Daniel, everybody. And we're just going to finish this with a touch of lime you want over the top. Yeah, it could be like that. Lime Perfect. zest. Yeah. Happy with that? Yeah. Just to reduce the flavour of the chilli down. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> dive into that. Go on, then, dive in. OK. Yeah. 
I mean, you know the mussels are going to taste delicious. I'll eat it out of the pot, to be honest with you. Mm. Yeah, may as well eat out of the pot. You're quite right. Oh, it's delicious. Like you say, that monkfish. Mm. Meaty. It's delicious, isn't it? Happy with that? I think I just need a minute to myself here. <laughs> uh, it's incredible. OK. Sabrina, are you happy so with that? So delicious, Chef. Daniel Garmisch, everybody. Amazing. <laughs> uh, we've still got time for one last dish. Uh, Join us again after the break. We're going to be treating Martin Roberts and Scott Quinnell to a show-stopping steak recipe with a French style butter. I'll see you then. Oh, that's delicious. Welcome back to the last part of the show, but I'm back in the kitchen with all my brilliant guests, Martin Roberts and Scott Quinnell. Yeah. Uh, now, I know, uh, obviously, both of you are food lovers. I thought I'd do, I thought I'd do show you how to cook a steak, because yes. I get all the messages from you. Martin, you've just gone and bought a pub. I have. Uh, particularly linked in together with Scott that we've got on here, so you'll be wanting to know how to cook steak when I, the chef walks out. I will, out. yeah, it's the top end of the Ronda Valley. <laughs> Outstanding. Yeah, it's a beautiful part of the world. What, uh, what made you buy a pub? I, well, you know, I'm middle-aged crisis, isn't it? It's my, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not taking my Harley Davidson across America. I'm, I'm opening a pub in the Ronda Valley. It's a pub, restaurant and a hotel. I never run a pub, I never run a restaurant, and I never run a hotel, so what could possibly go wrong? What, yeah, but what, you've seen a few, so you must have... Well, like, <laughs> <laughs> and you know what? I wouldn't want to do it anywhere else, but I've discovered the people in that part of Wales are just the salt of the earth. Oh, they are. And the valley people are just something I've never come across before. And there's a community there that's amazing. It really needs... This pub closed at the start of lockdown, and I can see it. It's at one end of what could be um, the, the, the Ronda Tunnel, which would be an amazing project to link uh, the Ronda Valley and uh, the Affen Valley and on down to Swansea. And this pub there, it's the only thing in the village, and... It's a really important community centre, and I just want to open it up with some disabled accommodation, which I want to build. And yeah, it's just it's a, it's a life project, I think. Yeah, that's for, a, for, for a great project. Players to stay in the, the <laughs> disabled accommodation. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. We're just going to blend this. This has got the metric to help part of it. So we've got a little bit of shallot, touch of garlic. It's purely option whether you put garlic or shallots in it. A uh, little bit of parsley. I've got so, a touch of lemon, and we can put a little bit of lemon zest in here, and. Uh, just blend this all up. This is a great sort of uh, a nice butter that you can just make. Stick it in the fridge or stick it in the freezer. It goes well with anything. Vegetables, a little bit of meat, fish, you know, all like that. Can really I just talk about this slice of steak that you put in there? Or yes. this virtually entire cow? Is that... Look at the gentleman next to you. What am I going to do? A mini steak? Look at him. <laughs> that is the biggest piece of steak I've ever seen in my no, life. No, it's well, not. Well, come around my house and you won't be. Really? <laughs> is, that, is this an every Saturday night in your place? Oh, yeah, yeah, wow. yeah, yeah. I actually cooked a quarter birthday the other day yeah. for two people. And um, I ate it all myself. And it was, <laughs> it was amazing. You were a Chateau Brion for one, are you? Oh, honestly. <laughs> but I tell you what, I, I don't get that. I must have the wrong pan in it because I don't get that sizzle. Uh, off my... Well, when, when you keep sending me messages and video messages going, it's not working, it's not working, it's not working, look at, look at the temperature of the pan. So the, the pan is... At home, you want this probably on a, about three-quarter heat. And the temptation with always with steak when you're cooking it, it's always to keep messing around with it. Just leave it in the pan. Yeah. Just leave it, let it, let it colour, and then you turn it over. You only really want to turn over steak once. You don't need to keep turning it and over, over and over, because you can't tell whether it's cooked. But there's a little tip I'll show you in a minute. I'm just Somebody... going to show you this butter, look. Salt and pepper, this mixture goes in here, a little bit of salt, the butter goes in, blend, and you blend this together, and you've got your simple maitre d'hotel butter. So when you're doing this, Martin, when the, the chef's phoned in sick... <laughs> <laughs> and I think I'm joking. <laughs> yes, I'm, I'm, I'm a ring. Trust me, I believe well done. <laughs> yeah. Would you open a restaurant, though, for me? Sorry? Do you want to turn out? Yeah, 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 well, here we go. Yeah, exactly. Look, I'm not committing myself onto television. I know that for a fact. Made that mistake before. Look. <laughs> uh, and then we're going to take our, our butter, and then what you want to do is then, in cling film, you can then grab a spoon or a spatula, and you take your butter like that, and then we Great can... Great colour, isn't it? Yeah, we can roll it all up. So this is where you can put paprika in it. I put a little bit of cayenne pepper. It's entirely up to you, but just a touch of cayenne there. But blend... The herbs, first of all, that's the key to that one. You want to get it nice and sort of green. And then take the cling film, like this, roll it up into a sausage, like that. It's very so, chefy. Well, it is, but it's much easier to do this when you come to serve it, you see? So you're rolling it up like that, and you can tie the ends, and as you tie the ends, it goes into a nice little sausage shape. Then what you do is pop that 
into the fridge, leave it in the fridge overnight, and you've got metatrol butter. So you take a slice of it as and where you want. So the steak, you can see, cooking away nicely, like that. Look at that, lovely colour on it. Do you know what? He wasn't even panicked, was he? He turned it over. No. <laughs> so that's this, the colour that you want on it. I love this thing, because I like my steak medium rare. I can never tell how to get it right without cutting into it. And then you end up with a piece of steak, which has got, like, it looks like somebody's already eaten it. He's got it. Medium rare. What do you mean? Medium rare. So that, that, that is... Uh, you can uh, the right way around, Scott. Red, <laughs> red, red. red. <laughs> that's, that's medium rare. Yeah, put that's, your fingers that, together that, like that. That's well done. Rare. Or the other way around? Yes. No wonder they can't get it right. <laughs> <laughs> no wonder I can't get it right. And even you've got the softest hands I know. Look, honest, this, honest, not honest, that honest bit, it. that's bone here. That Pick, bit? That oh, bit there. Yeah. There. Rare. Oh, wow. Next thing up, medium totally rare. Change the way I'm going to cook steak really? ever again. Well done. You're Honestly, you're that is just the yeah, way it's squidgy. When you see chefs doing this, you see? Right. They're doing it because of that. And it's just purely because of... Yeah, the same sort of texture, the text, texture of that. So this, I'm going to take the, the uh, little bit of chicken. I'm having a word, my friend at home. He told me, he was like, ah, for years, they've all, <laughs> come, they've all come out like the top of my hand. <laughs> and then we're just going to blend this now, and I'm going to cook my uh, nice little bit of... I've got some of this. This is this lovely sort of chicory that we've got in here. Now, we talked about, obviously, the iconic shows that you've done. I mean, Homes Under Hammer, you, to, to celebrate 20 years of doing that, we just touched on it earlier. That must be, that must be amazing. I know. Well, we're hoping with this some kind of celebration to... To market, but it's extraordinary when you look back. And I think it, the pro it's been through the ups and downs of the property market, and everyone worries about what's happening in the world of property. And I think it's, it's just cyclical. You know, it will have its ups, it will have its downs, and over the years, it's it's managed to, to, to sort of ride the storm. But I think Holmes has just, you know, it's it's just monitored what's happened. And there's always been this fascination with with property and and the fact that you can the sort of stuff, the variety of stuff that comes up at auction as well, everything from toilet blocks to castles. And that's to... the great thing, and that's the great yeah. thing, I think, what the show covers. It creates uh, not only the people that are involved in it, but the, the, the buildings. Know. Know, what on earth are you buying that for? Because auctions, you do get some really weird stuff. Right, look, we've just got our nice little bit of chicory. This 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 is amazing, this chicory. When you when you cook it, you, you, you basically treat it a little bit like steak, really, with this. And this is, you know, when Daniel... T Daniel say the French love sort of cooking with lettuce and that kind of stuff. When you when you cook it, it's amazing. So this is the steak now. This is where it starts to get interesting. This is where you pick decide how well you want it cooked. So you press this, hold it together. That's medium rare. I know it's medium rare now, so I can take it off the heat and I can nap it over the top with the butter. And this is where you get that beautiful colour, you see? Over the top. Wow. And this is where we leave it to rest a little bit. And while it's sat there, a little... Um, tip from an amazing chef in France, a guy called Wolfgang Puck. It's not my idea, but when I was over there, he runs a restaurant called Cut. He's got this amazing restaurant. And he took a stock cube, a beef stock cube, and sprinkled it over the top. That is so random. So it's this umami sort of flavour with a stock cube over the top. I, all I've done is season this steak with, with salt, so black pepper now, and we leave it to rest. Sit there. And it doesn't go any more cooked, despite No, that. when chefs are serving steak, they will usually <clears throat> serve it at room temperature. I just, I just don't have the patience. What oh. do you mean? Well, well, once it's like that, I just want to go... Is it cold enough? No, no. I, you know, I, I'm one of these people. I, you know, I, 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 my lips are burnt after I've cooked anything, because I'm, I'm just trying everything before it comes out. Ah! <laughs> oh. So this is, this is the nice little bit of... This is where we finish off our... A little bit of the radicchio. So you can take this, this... All I've done is take some breadcrumbs and you toast this in a pan with a little bit of breadcrumbs. You put a little bit of garlic in there to get a touch of flavour. Touch of lemon at the end. A little bit of that. Some salt and pepper, and you'd be amazed how this tastes. And we just lift that out. That's that done. And you can serve this. Easy it's, as it's it. It's just so quick as well, isn't it? Well, it's, it's quicker to do it like this than actually speak to you on the phone, to be honest with you, Scott. But... <laughs> All right, I'll afford again. <laughs> it's much easier then, are you here? I'll Did just you invite you in. speed dial or something? Uh, yeah, Cookery I... speed dial? More or less, more or less. <laughs> I just got to cook I got, I got him as chef and survival mode. <laughs> just in case I messed up. You know what I mean? No, what do I do? Chef! More butter, <laughs> more butter and it's not hot enough. Really? Exactly. Yeah. It's yeah. not hot enough, no butter. We've sorted that out. <laughs> exactly. Who has James Martin as their emergency... Wow. Yeah. 
You can't That's argue impressive. with that. No, right. absolutely. Look, we just got in here a nice little bit of steak, like this. Does he call you for advice on anything? Uh, well, he's, he's never wanted to scrummage. Yeah. So, uh, <laughs> he's never been in the position where he thought, I'm in the rock and the mall, how do I get out of this? <laughs> There's time yet. <laughs> but, and you want it medium rare, so... Oh, my gosh. There you have it. Medium rare, but not forgetting, of course, you've got the meta to tell butter, which we've made. Nice do you ever butter. heard the cows out your back? Do I heard a cows? Yeah, you must oh, have for the, the day. the butter you go through. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, quite a factory actually, but no, I do. I'd, but I'd rather eat that. You wouldn't eat margarine, would you? No, no. I mean, I, I wouldn't eat margarine. No. You wouldn't eat margarine. Your diet must have been amazing, though, when you you were fully playing. You could eat anything, I suppose, could you? Or... I still do. Look at me. <laughs> 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 yeah, hey, well, well. No, no. We used to have guys that used to, you know, sort of come around. Wayne Proctor and Peter Herbert would come around and make right. sure, see, see how much you got on you and, really? you know, weigh, really? you, weigh you every Monday morning. <laughs> and, uh, you know what I mean? And oh, but, you, but, went but, through, you went through quite a lot of stress, of stress with your, you know, particularly your knees. It fascinated me what you were yeah. doing with your knees. I mean, you, you went through all manner of stress with your knees as well when you were I was born with kneecaps in two. So I, I was told at 24 by uh, Bob Leish and uh, the surgeon, you need to stop playing. I said, well, I can't do anything else. So they, they kept on putting wow. silicon and that in my knees. They, every Monday, they'd, they'd pull all the, the fluid out and put uh, silicon in my knees. And then, uh, yeah, it allowed me to go to level 32 then. So, so it was quite nice. But uh, they, they'd wait. in the end, it got so scientific. This is why I retired. Basically, I retired because they brought those tight shirts in. And uh, as soon as they came in, I thought, I'm, I'm out of this game. You know, I like the cotton, the old cotton, big ones. And then they started weighing you before training. They, wow. they weighed you after training to see how much fluid you lost. And you had to take, if you'd lost two kilos of fluid, you had to take two and a half litres of water home with you and drink it by the time you got home and everything. So I drink two and a half litres and then a bottle of wine. So I thought, ah, time to retire. Well, there you go. Time to well, retire. You're, you've got a steak now, but like I said, like said, ladies and gentlemen, what an amazing morning. But there we have it. My steak with Metro to tell, but Done. Nice. Wow. There we have it. Wow. Thank you Stay. very much. Oh, oh my oh, lord, that oh, looks fantastic. Oh, compliment to the chef. Tell me what you think. I can already tell you what I think. <laughs> oh, that is beautiful. Oh, my Perfect word. as well, isn't it? Cooked all right for you. Medium rare. Mm. Wow. That's all we've got time for today. A massive thank you to all my guests, Heather and Manel, for that amazing produce earlier on in the show. Sabrina Gida, uh, Daniel Gomes, and of course, our brilliant guests, Scott Quinnell and Martin Roberts. Hey. Hey. See ya. Best luck with everything, guys. Thank you. Thank you, James. Uh, we'll see you back at the same time next Saturday morning. We're joined by more top chefs, other brilliant guests. Until then, have a great weekend. See you at my house next Saturday morning. Bye for now. <laughs> <laughs>